Good morning, all. Uh, this is the Doug and Randy show. This is the second one we've done during this coronavirus uh, outbreak. Uh, we welcome you. Yeah, this will be time delayed, I'm sure, from the time we're doing it. Um, we are in Unit 19, Session 5. That's the lesson for March 29th, 2020. And we're glad to have you with us. Let's open with prayer. Doug, would you please? Our Father, we are so thankful to be able to do this, to have this technology where we can come together, Father, uh, in your presence and in your name. And Father, where two or three are gathered, you are there also. Our Heavenly Father, we are privileged to, uh, even while we're having to stay apart and uh, not come together physically, that Father, uh, through the technology you have allowed us to have, we are able to come, Father, and uh, be a church. And Father, as your word teaches us, that the church is not the building, it's the people. And so, Father, as we gather together today to learn more about your word and more about you, we just pray your blessings upon us in this time. Father, I just would like to pray for those of our Sunday school class in particular, uh, the two who were paralyzed for those with cancer, Father, for those uh, having different difficulties, uh, Father, and uh, especially those, Father, who uh, are in need of your touch. We just ask that your will would be done in each and every case as you see best, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Doug. This morning's lesson uh, involves, still in, we're still in Luke, um, basically Luke, the second chapter, and the really 40 through 52, pretty much the last few verses of that chapter. We're going to see this morning that uh, Jesus is in the temple, um, separated from his parents after they had gone to the Passover, and um, Mary and Joseph's reaction, Mary in particular, and uh, what Je how Jesus responds. Um, we're going to be looking uh, at these verses, uh, and I think the, the preeminent thought process here is uh, to understand that Jesus is both fully divine as well as fully human. He carries both aspects in his uh, earthly ministry, his earthly life. I think there's a tendency to think that Jesus, um, in his divinity, um, knew everything and... and uh, in many ways he did. The Holy Spirit, I think, certainly was with him. But he also grew up as a, as a normal human being. He doesn't really begin his ministry until the age of 30. We find him today at age 12. And of course, we're well aware of, at Christmas time, of the birth of Jesus. Uh, these are really the three points that we have in Scripture uh, regarding his, his human existence, his, his birth, and then in the temple here, and then later, at, at the age of 30, 18 years later after today's message, um, we find he begins his ministry. Uh, but I think it is important that <clears throat> we understand his dual nature. Um, now, there have been many controversies in the, with the early theolo theologians regarding this. Many people thought that Jesus <clears throat> was divine but lacked humanity. That is to say, growing up the way we have. And others thought he was um, a good person but fully human without that divine nature. And this created many controversies in the early church. But what we're going to see today, I think, helps us to understand that even at an early age, at the age when normally uh, a young Jewish lad would have uh, become basically a man, uh, at this point in his life, he was already well aware of who he was and what his nature was, the dual nature that he carried. Nonetheless, uh, we don't want to de-emphasize the fact that he was born as a baby. He was a toddler. Um, he, you know, was a, was a young lad um, and then developed into a man and really lived a fairly normal life, uh, human life at least, uh, for many years until at about the age 30 he began his ministry. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at today as we look at these scriptures. Uh, Doug, would you like to read us the, the first scripture? This is uh, uh, Luke Chapter 2, verse 40 through 47. Okay. The boy grew up and became strong, 
filled with wisdom, and God's grace was upon him. Every year, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. I think we see in verse 40, uh, Scripture says that the boy grew up. Uh, That is to say, he he matured, um, as we would expect any human being to. He became strong. Now, remember that he was a carpenter's son and probably himself was a carpenter. Generally, uh, youngsters followed in the footsteps of their parents, uh, particularly the the father. But it also says that he was filled with wisdom and God's grace was on him. I think we see here uh, both the humanity growing up, becoming strong, but we also see the divinity of Christ in that he is filled with wisdom and wisdom comes from God, and he was also uh, filled with God's grace. God's grace was on him. So we see the, the divine and the human nature in this one verse. A little later, verse uh, 40, well, 41, the next verse, uh, shows us that the family did exactly what Jewish families were to do at that time. There were three festivals that they were supposed to attend, and the Passover festival would have been the most important. Um, and so when he is 12, which would have been the age at which a young Jewish lad would have basically be, be in the process of becoming seen as an adult, um, they went up. Now, it wouldn't be unusual that uh, there would be a, a whole caravan of people going from one town to the next uh, and finally in, into Jerusalem uh, for the Passover festival. Uh, many times families gathered, and they are friends and families. And part of this was because the roads were very unsafe. There were robbers uh, and, you know, that would have uh, seized on a small group of people. But a larger group, they probably wouldn't have bothered. And also it gave companionship for what was really quite a journey. Um, so we see that the, uh, the parents took Jesus, uh, and very likely, uh, by 12 years old, perhaps some other children they may have had, Mary and Joseph may have had. No. Pardon. One of the things that I read in background was that uh, when they traveled in these caravans, that they would usually put the children first, and then they would put the ladies in the group in the middle, yeah. and then the men, for protection, would stay in the back. Right. So it's not unusual for them not to see their child right. the entire day because they would be with all the other kids. Mm-hmm. The women, so they could talk, would be with all the other women, and then the men would follow in the uh, train uh, in the very back. Right. Very good. Um, again, let's go back to Scripture. Uh, it says that uh, after the days were over, they, they left, they were returning, but Jesus stayed behind. The Scripture doesn't tell us why he stayed behind. I think we see it uh, eventually here that he was you know, going to be in his father's house. He was going to be in the temple and you know, searching Scripture with really some very... W- probably some very well-known theologians of the day, Jewish theologians. Um, but they assumed he was in the party, as Doug just pointed out. If the, uh, the women and children, or children first, women and then men, then it, they would have been separated. Both Mary and Joseph would have been separated from Jesus at the time. Um, and assuming that he was with them, um, they didn't bother too much about it, I think. Uh, but when they'd gone a day's journey, I think, and probably as the families regathered, um, they began looking for Jesus among, it says, the, the, their relatives and their friends. And when they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem in searching for him. Um, I mean, a 12-year-old is very capable of taking care of themselves, I think. But obviously, if you have a 12-year-old child and all of a sudden that child is not there, you're going to be concerned. Yeah. That's just human nature. So they began to search for him. It says after three days, uh, they found him. And he was sitting among the teachers. Now, look at this. He was both listening to them, but he was also asking them questions. Now, for a 12-year-old, this would have been pretty significant. 
to listen to these teachers would be one thing. But to actually ask questions, and undoubtedly some penetrating questions, good questions, intelligent, um, deep questions, uh, this would have been a little unusual for a 12-year-old. Um, now notice it says that all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. So it was both that he, he understood what they were talking about. I don't know many 12-year-olds, Doug, that really, if you can talk in deep theological terms, would, would understand. Mm -hmm. Even some high school students. I taught my daughter's high school class a week ago, and uh, great kids. Uh, but I may have been talking way above them. I'm used to talking to adults, so it wouldn't be unusual that I was talking above them. Um, but also his answers, uh, when he was questioned or when he, you know, had an issue, uh, his answers were also penetrating. And once again, I think we see wisdom and grace in, in this particular um, interaction that Jesus is having. Now, going back a little bit, when you're talking about the three days, instead of thinking, well, they're, they're searching frantically for three days, they had already gone a day's journey which meant they had to go back a day's journey. So there's two days right there. Mm -hmm. So they caught him on the third day or found him on the third day. So, you know, it's not like they were searching frantically for him for three days. They had gone a day's journey away. They had to go a day's journey back. And then they spent that day looking for him and they found him that afternoon in the temple. So right. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things we're gonna see in these next couple of sections here um, is that uh, Jesus is really a perfect role model for not just for children but he's a, a perfect role model for all humanity um, uh, when they are there for the Passover uh, he is certainly uh, fulfilling uh, a need uh, and a requirement really of the law uh, and yet at the same time um, during this this episode, we see that Jesus was also um, uh, involved with the law. He, he understood the law. Now, where this understanding comes from isn't just from reading scripture and study, but, you know, there's that divinity that Jesus knew what the law was. And let's face it, if he wrote the law, if he, you know, was a part of founding the law, if you will, giving the law to humanity, then he certainly knew it better than any of these teachers knew it. But at the age of 12, I think he was just coming to understand a lot of what that was all about. Obviously, as a toddler, he may not have understood because he was human. He, remember, he grew up. But by the age of 12, when you become an adult in the Jewish society, then I think at that point, he really did understand a, a lot about the law. And he, he was beginning to understand his divine nature. Thoughts? Well, <clears throat> when Jesus begins his ministry, we see that he, again, interprets the law. We know in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it's been said, it has been said. Whenever he uses that term or something like it, mm -hmm. he's re referencing their traditional understanding of it. You know, it's been said, you know, don't uh, make a vow upon, you know, the altar mm -hmm. or the goat upon the altar. Well, they change it in their tradition saying, well, don't do it upon the goat. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Jesus said, what's more holy, you know, the altar or the goad? Uh, when they came to marriage, he says, you know, it's written, don't commit adultery. But I say anyone who looks upon a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. And, and, and the others that he had to reinterpret for them, as you said earlier, and I think is really so right, is because he's the one who helped write it mm -hmm. in the very beginning. So we see here at a, a young age, he's listening to them, he's probably instructing them somewhat, challenging them. <laughs> anyway, their their thought press of what they think the law is. And then when he actually begins his ministry, he gives them the full interpretation of what the law says. That's very, very pertinent. The, uh, uh, the doll he's talking about, Doug's talking about, of course, is, uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Um, and in fact, you're, you're right on target. Uh, he gives really f f how do you fulfill the law well christ in those th three chapters tells us exactly how the law is to be fulfilled and interestingly of course matthew was written to mostly a jewish audience and so in matthew we find jesus 
and, and Matthew picking up this thought that um, Jesus is going to fulfill the law, and he, he's going to show them how to fulfill the law, not simply how to keep it uh, as the rabbis would have, would have told, but he's going to say, now this is what it means, and this is how we keep it today, and this is what I'm here for. Um, you know, the, the Passover was a time for the Jews to be thankful for what God had done for them uh, for centuries, but also a time to, to remember uh, the goodness that God had, had, had given to them. Um, other thoughts or comments, Doug? Well, when we come to the New Testament, we see Paul saying over and over again that uh, our Paschal lamb has been sacrificed. Mm -hmm. uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, and I wrote it down, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. It's interesting here. He's going up every year to celebrate the Passover, mm -hmm. which is actually ultimately going to be fulfilled when he makes his sacrifice upon the cross. Right. And, uh, you know, as we've talked about before, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. Uh, in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, Paul tells us there that all the promises that were given to Israel are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we see here that it's just, to me, interesting, as we looked last week when he was a, a baby and now this week, even as a youth, how uh, he is still fulfilling all the Old Testament prophecies in that he is going to be the ultimate Passover lamb who is going to give himself once and forever, never to be sacrificed again. Mm -hmm. The rituals is that yearly they had to do the Passover feast. They had to celebrate uh, the time in which uh, the lamb was slain and the blood was put on the lintel and on the doorpost. And uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get a, get ahead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But as we look at Jesus and see Jesus, uh, even as a youth of 12, uh, his thought process of going up to celebrate the Passover, knowing that he was going to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Good point. Just uh, uh, just something caught my attention was the fact that the, the three days in which they, you know, had really didn't know where he was. Uh, isn't it interesting that his parents come back to look for him but in, in three days, with three days' time? And also we find at the, at the resurrection, there's a, a three-day time period there in which uh, other people were seeking him as well, his, his disciples and uh, Mary and, uh, and Salome and others. Um, I just find that three-day cycle an interesting one at the start and now. The numerology in the Bible is yeah. astounding, especially yeah. numbers like 40. We see 40 days, mm -hmm. you know, it rained 40 days, 40 days. Right. We know that Jesus was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. Right. Uh, uh, we see numbers uh, 7 so often, especially yeah. in the book of Revelation, yes. uh, here three, and I never thought of that. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. And uh, other numbers that, for some reason, that God uses those numbers over and over again. Yeah, and I think there is there are people who who mm, do a lot more deep understanding of numerology in the Bible than I do. But I think you're right, though. There are certain numbers that just seem to reoccur, and for some reason, uh, I think they're used in a significant way. You know. Let's turn to the next section, and that is uh, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 48 through 50. Doug, you mind reading those for us? Yes. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And you can almost hear the pain in her voice. <laughs> well, why are you searching for me? Jesus asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for him to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. This is interesting, I think, from the perspective uh, that after searching for him for, for several days, and then they find him, uh, maybe it was just that one day, you know, in which they were maybe in Jerusalem. Uh, I think that was a good point you made. Um, but when they found him uh, in the temple, it says they were astonished. Now, I don't know if they were astonished because he was found or they were astonished because he was in the temple. I, I kind of myself think it was because he was in the temple. Um, notice what Mary says here, though, son, why have you treated us like this? Um, there's one perspective that says uh, that um, she just didn't expect 
Jesus to stay behind, that she expected him to be with the other kids. That would have been the expectation of a mother to a, a child. Um, but there's another perspective here, and that is maybe Mary just didn't recognize at this point that at the age of 12, typically a Jewish lad would have become a man. And this was really his maturity coming through, his, his adultness, if you will, coming through, even at the age, age of 12. Um, you know, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Um, I, I think that it does. You, you do hear a little anguish, I think, in this, you know, that, you know, we thought we'd lost you. We thought something had happened to you, you know. Do you think part of it may have been, too, because Jesus is the oldest. By now, they have had other children. We know that Joseph and Mary never uh, were together until Jesus was born. But they would have several biological children. We know that uh, in one of the books, I believe it's John, it says his brothers, and it names three of them, and his sisters. Mm -hmm. So we know he had other siblings uh, who are biologically right. the children of Joseph and Mary. Right. Uh, and so as being the oldest, maybe she is saying to him, well, you know, you should be uh, setting an example for your younger brothers and sisters. They always say that to the oldest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And you're an oldest child, too, I believe, aren't you? Yes, I am. So yeah, I know. <laughs> you know some of the expectations oh, yes. that parents have on the oldest child. Yes, indeed. Uh, and Jesus answers then uh, the, the queries from, from Mary. Um, why were you searching for me? That, it's an interesting response. Um, you know, she wants to know, why have you treated us this way? Don't you know I've been anxious? I mean, she's coming from a human perspective, very clearly. But notice how Jesus responds to that. And, and why were you searching for me? You know, didn't you know? You know, don't you understand? And then he goes on to say, with a little fulfillment here, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? Um, now, remember, Mary and Joseph both understood that this was going to be the, uh, the Messiah. This was going to be the salvation of Israel and ultimately to, you know, to the Gentile world as well. Uh, and yet, I'm, I'm not sure they fully understood that. As a matter of fact, the next piece of scripture here says, but they did not understand what he said to them. Um, they didn't understand, I guess, that Jesus was supposed to be in that, in that temple. He was supposed to be learning. He was supposed to be teaching. I don't know how much learning he had to do, but as, as, a, human, as a human person, 12 years old, there would be learning to be done as well. But he also had many good questions that were, I think, putting a lot of the teachers uh, in a position where they had to address those, those issues. I wonder if maybe the question, why were you searching for me, meant more. They probably had spent the day looking in the places where the children had played, mm -hmm. you know, and he's saying to them, why are you searching there? You should have come here first. Yeah, good point. You know, didn't you know I would be in my father's house about my father's business? You, you're you the ones who have had the angel, you know, <laughs> yeah. tell you and forecast yeah. to you. Right. So this should have been the first place that you came. Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. I think also part of the understanding is if he says, um, I had to, you know, I need to be in my father's house, um, part of that may have been the word father. Now, I think they understood the divinity of Christ, but I also wonder if um, there was confusion about in Joseph's house, you know, is that the house you're talking about of your father? And in fact, for the next 18 years, that's exactly where he was, you know, becoming a carpenter, doing carpentry things, and probably helping his father until Joseph died. Um, but I, this may have been part of the misunderstanding. Uh, the, the, they couldn't necessarily separate the human part of Jesus from the divine part of Jesus, which they understood, I think, was supposed to come, but maybe they didn't under think it was going to come at 12 years old. I think that may be the point, and that is that, you know, knowing that he was going to be, you know, the Savior of the world, they thought would happen later on in adulthood. And so, you know, at this time, I think they expect more just being a kid, right. you know, more, more doing the childish things and being like their other children. Right. And yet he's not. Even at the age of 12 now, he, we see that he has an understanding of whom he is and what he's supposed to be doing. There are, our, our lesson authors point out two things in this particular passage. Um, incidentally, I didn't realize this at the time, but uh, these are the first words 
from Christ in Luke's, Luke's gospel, the first time Jesus really speaks. Uh, but when he speaks, he is speaking about his identity, you know, who he was, not just, not just Mary and Joseph's child, but that he had a divine nature. And that was his real identity was with the Father, in, in Father God. But also they point out that there's a focus here from Jesus on what his mission is. Uh, his mission was to be in the temple, to be in his father's house, um, sharing what he, know, what he knew, and also trying to understand, I think, where other people were coming from, but also what he needed to be doing. So his, his identity, we see in these, these scriptures his identity being shown, but we also see that he's speaking to his mission as well. I thought that was a very interesting uh, p a point from, the, um, from the, the writers of our lesson today. You know, uh, in the teacher's book, it talks about Luke bookending uh, Jesus being in the temple. That in the beginning we read last week when we studied about how Ananias and Simeon came and met him. And now here we have Jesus at the age of 12. And then we see at the end of his life, we see him teaching in the temple. And then before the crucifixion, he's driving out the money changers mm -hmm. and that at the temple. And so... This indeed is bookend, you know, that the, the temple is very important to Jesus. Uh, in fact, he says at one place, you know, it's, it's to be a place of worship, mm -hmm. but you made it into a den of robbers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important, uh, especially as we think of some of the things that are going on in the name of Christ today with the uh, health and wealth gospels and some of the other things that are calling yourself Christianity out there, which you know, really don't represent what the true gospel is about at all. That's a good point. Very good point. Let's turn, if we can now, to our third uh, section, which is uh, in Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. A couple short verses. Doug, you want to read those for us, please? Okay. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom stature, and in favor with God and with the people. Now, at the end of this uh, event in the, in the temple, we see that Jesus was obedient to his parents. Um, he says he went down with them um, to Nazareth, where they, where, they where they were living, and he was obedient to them, which takes us back, I think, to the fifth commandment, you know, uh, to obey our parents and to, you know, to honor them. And that's what Jesus did. And in fact, uh, there's nothing else recorded in the Scripture from this event in age 12 to when he begins his ministry. So this is a very important time for Jesus. Uh, at 12, he understood, I think, what his mission was going to be. He understood who his divine father was. And yet, for the next 18 years, he lived what was a normal life, uh, finding favor, it says, with God, but also with people. So he was a... I think you'd say he was a model citizen um, and, a, and a good person to everyone who, who came to him. That would mean also he was a good carpenter. Yes, exactly. I mean, if he had a good reputation, as you said, he was a carpenter's son. In fact, he's even called uh, when they're talking about him and his different uh, miracles he's doing and different things. They ask, is this not the carpenter? So he actually uh, had for a while, mm -hmm. uh, the profession as a carpenter, and when it says he found favor with them, it would also mean that in his everyday life, he did it with good quality. That mm -hmm. meant whatever he made for them, he made uh, superior. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it would be what they expected and probably a little bit more. And I think this speaks to us in our own lives, uh, you know, as Christians, how we're uh, to give a good day's work for a good day's pay, mm -hmm. that we are to be about our Father's business too. Mm -hmm. And a good portion of being about our Father's business is going to work, doing a job that we're getting paid to do, mm -hmm. and then you know coming home in the evening, uh, evening satisfied that we knew that we had done all that we were supposed to do right. in order to you know glorify God and find favor with men. Can't you imagine being a... Uh, a Jewish person at the time of, of Christ and going to his shop and asking for a chair or a table or something and 
I mean, can you imagine? Here's, here's God making a little table for me. Here's God making a chair for me. I mean, you know, you wouldn't have legs falling off. You, <laughs> you wouldn't have the table splitting in two or something. You, you would have a quality-made product. And one you could be very proud of, I'm sure. I would like to have a small table today with Jesus brand on the bottom. Yeah, of the table. yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. That'd be worth something. <laughs> yeah. Um, notice, though, we pick up these words again in verse 52, which says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Now, the wisdom, I think, obviously speaks to his divine nature, his understanding and, and, and wisdom, that somehow he has to. He has to gain that. Now, I think very clearly the Holy Spirit, and you know, is imbuing him with the un with understanding. But you know, wisdom doesn't just come out of the blue. But I think in Christ's case, it does kind of come out of the blue. He's he's obedient to his parents, but he's also obedient to his father, and because of that, he becomes wise very clearly. And, but also, the second part of that is stature. That speaks to his humanity again, that he was blessed with wisdom, I think, on the divine side, but also in stature. Yes, and I think God blesses him with a, a strong body. We see that at, at the crucifixion, a strong body, um, but probably uh, stature being also um, maybe tall, but healthy, uh, muscular. That would come from being a carpenter as well. That's true. Yeah. yeah, his profession. Right. Going back a little bit uh, <clears throat> to where you're talking about his wisdom. Now, being the unique Godson uh, that he was, uh, that doesn't mean we can't have wisdom today. Mm -hmm. uh, because James 1 5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask a God who gives it freely. Mm -hmm. And I think that should encourage us. Now, it's, I don't, when I read that passage, I don't think it's Solomon's wisdom. Because Solomon gained all wisdom, mm -hmm. earthly wisdom, uh, mainly is what it's talking about there. We see even in his old age that he went into foolishness, mm -hmm. which shows he didn't have all the spiritual wisdom that he should have had. Right. And so when James 1, 5 said, if any man lacks wisdom, I think it's talking about spiritual wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, understanding of the Bible, understanding of God, who he is, what he's trying to do, and ultimately his second coming. Uh, when he's going to come back again. So we can grow in wisdom too. Right. And I think as Christians, that's something we should be uh, making as a goal, pressing on towards, as Paul says in Philippians, that uh, doing all we can by reading the Bible. Now, we're not going to get it all at once, as mm -hmm. you said, like Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not going to come upon us. Uh, too bad we can't put our Bible under a pillow and through osmosis, you know, it just <laughs> absorbs. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, through reading the Bible daily, through prayer, through fellowship, one Christian with another, you know, because we know that iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. And then through uh, Sunday school is what we're trying to do here. And then uh, after this is all over, we can gather together as a church body and assembly. All these things work to give us wisdom and give us knowledge so that we can grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior. Um, I think there is... Just in the natural maturing and understanding Scripture, um, we do become wiser, I think, in our relationships. Uh, not to say that we're all perfect. We're not. <laughs> make a lot of mistakes. Um, I make my wife mad all the time, I can tell you. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we, we can grow in earthly wisdom when we are growing in spiritual wisdom. I think, it, I think the spiritual wisdom that we gain from, you know, uh, reading the Bible, from... Uh, even reading comments on the Bible. They, those are sometimes very enlightening. Um, but I think that divine wisdom that we have, uh, theological wisdom, if you want to say, helps us also in just dealing with the earthly matters that we have to deal with. Uh, we can deal with things like the coronavirus uh, as Christians in a way that many non-believers just can't. They're, they're afraid. Uh, they're fearful. I can tell you, I, I may catch it tomorrow, but I'm not going to be fearful about it. You know, after four years of kidney disease, my wife and I, just we just weren't fearful. We never had any fear. Uh, we just, it was in God's hands, and whatever was going to happen was going to happen. That's the attitude, uh, I think, that comes with, um, with spiritual wisdom. Yeah, that's and, having yeah. a high view of God. Yes. You know, 
if we believe first and foremost that God is sovereign, and I believe this is where, you know, it all starts, mm -hmm. and that is with God being in control of all things, then if he wants us to die, we're going to die, and there's nothing we can stop it. If he wants us to live, if we're going to live, and no one can stop that either. Mm -hmm. and, and so ultimately, it's up to God. And, and there shouldn't be any fear except for fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. right. You know, remember uh, Jesus saying, don't fear him who can kill the body and do no more, but fear him who can take body and soul and mm -hmm. cast him to hell. Uh, God is the only one who can do that. Mm -hmm. And so as believers who put their faith in Jesus, the Savior and Lord, we know that we are safe in Christ. That is, our souls are safe with him, and then ultimately when we die, we go to be with the Lord. But at the same time, it means we are safe in our human bodies too because we know we have God's sovereign uh, Holy Spirit watching over us and protecting us too. Mm -hmm. And again, that that's an earthly wisdom that is spiritual in nature. Without the spiritual wisdom, would we be more like the pagans, if you will, unsaved? Would we be more fearful? I think we would be. I mean, when you stop to think about it, if, if, uh, if you have no faith um, in something, you're always going to be fearful of everything. If you have faith in Christ... Uh, you have no reason to be to be fearful of anything, uh, and I think that, again, the 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 spiritual wisdom helps with our earthly wisdom, and it allows us to to deal in such a way and to act in such a way that typically unbelievers are afraid. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to go out and buy every roll of toilet paper I can find. I'm not going to clean the shelf of alcohol, <laughs> you know, so I can make my own hand sanitizer. I, we're just not going to do that. You, you take care of the, the needs of the day, and, you know, God will take care of, of our needs tomorrow. That's right. you know, uh, but I think as non-Christians, uh, this fear leads them into a panic mode. And, um, again, I think we should take every disease seriously. I took my kidney disease very seriously. We, you know, Donna hooked me up over a thousand nights so I could, you know, so I could continue to live. Um, there are other people who, you know, help me as well. But we should not be fearful of those things. If we have a God-centered uh, mindset, we should never fear whatever it is that we're going to be facing out there. And if you don't have that spiritual mindset and, and, and devotion to Christ, and, then you're, you're going to be afraid of everything. And that's just really so unfortunate when I see people just fearful or, or taking advantage of the situation. Uh, those are just not Christian attitudes. Right. You know, we as Christians should be giving an example, like we should not be hoarding right. during this time and, and show our faith in God and uh, being an example to other people so that they can see Christ in us. That, you know, we are to be those who show that uh, what's really important and that we believe that God is truly sovereign in our lives. Right. And again, we show that sovereignty, you know, in, in our daily walk. Uh, you know, as Jesus, um, as Jesus was growing, I think very clearly he was growing in wisdom. He was growing physically. Um, and we, we see, you know, in favoring becoming in favor with God and with people, that he was also socially um, growing and maturing. It's interesting, I think, to think that as a carpenter, he was finding favor with people. Even as he began his ministry, there were many who were finding favor uh, with him. But at the end, how many people really, you know, saw him in a favorable light? They wanted to crucify him, you know, give us the thief, but, you know, get this guy out of here. Uh, it's a total, a 180 degree turn from being a, car, a good carpenter to, you know, being the son of God and the Messiah. People just couldn't accept it. But Jesus was, was growing in all those things. And at the same time, very clearly, I think there's a growing relationship with his father. We see that, I think, in his life. So. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we, we see this as Jesus uh, uh, goes from a child... Uh, there's a passage in Hebrews, I believe, where it says that he learned through suffering. And, and so in his humanity, in his human portion, 
there were things that he had to learn that he knew in his godness. Mm -hmm. But it was only through actually experiencing those things that he came to know them. And it may have been because the verse that says Jesus uh, is like us, uh, been tempted like us in all things yet without sin. Mm -hmm. How could he really be a savior who could feel our hurts had he not gone through them himself? And so by going through them, he learned something that in the Godhead they didn't know until he had actually experienced that. And so it gave him an empathy mm -hmm. uh, where there had only been sympathy before that. That's a good way to, that's a good way to put it. Um, I've always wondered, I guess it's, the thought has crossed my mind, um, we know that Jesus gave up certain prerogatives in the, in the divine nature of the Son of God. Um, but exactly what were those elements that he gave up, and exactly what is it that he, that he had to learn, if you will, as a human being? Um, and I see again, I go back to last week's lesson where we talked about um, that scripture is not exhaustive. This is just one little story between birth and 30 years old. Um, the, only, the only really narrative that we have. But yet there were other things going on during that 30 years. Um, so it's not exhaustive. But this gives us a little understanding, a sufficient understanding of the divine and the, and the human nature of Christ that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be faulted, if you will, um, it, by not understanding that there are dual natures there. Um, yeah, we're never going to understand it all in this life. No. no. You know, we, we're only given enough that for, uh, as Peter says, for faith and belief. For faith and living is what he says. And so, you know, we're to take many things by faith alone that we're not going to understand completely or, or in fact, I've heard it said, and, and I can't remember who the quote comes from, but they say that if we study God often enough and deep enough, it's always going to end in mystery. And that's because God is so far beyond us, mm -hmm. you know, that we're never going to understand everything uh, that he had to uh, say to us through his word. We only got a minute or two now. Right. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this uh, little examination of uh, Jesus in the temple and missing from his family. And again, the central point here is that Jesus had both a divine nature as well as a human nature. And uh, we will see that in other places in the scripture, particularly in the Gospels, um, where Jesus is dealing with both of these issues uh, simultaneously, actually. Um, but we, we see, I think, in some of the other Gospel stories, uh, the growth that Jesus is really exhibiting, all the way to the point where even, you know, just before his crucifixion, you know, he is praying in the garden and, and I think developing still what is this all about and, and what's going to go on and, and how it's going to work. And he's naturally not questioning God so much as just, you know, co coming to wisdom about what is about to happen. Well, let's uh, break it here and we will uh, soon, I hope, be back together to fellowship. Uh, and until then, we're going to be exploring places, I guess, in the church here that to set up and talk a little bit about the Scripture. Thoughts? I, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in, and we'll be back here next week. And no uh, hope that you'll tune in for that, too. Let's word, close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity that we have to fellowship with uh, those who will be listening in. Uh, we pray that this has been... Um, uh, met with open hearts as we have tried to open our heart and our mind to your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to share the, your scripture. Uh, we know this comes directly from you. We believe that, and therefore we take it as the truth, and we are happy to share that with whoever will listen. Uh, we pray that uh, for those that are listening that this will be a good week, uh, that you will keep your hand upon us uh, health-wise, um, economically, and, and uh, help us to do those things which we need to do to show uh, the Christian love that, uh, that we have, just as you have that same love for us. So we ask this all in your precious name. Amen.